rationing. And the screen magazine in its second issue tried to explain the reason. Hello, my name is Dean Contover, and this is the History Show. On the History Show, we try to um, interview veterans who uh, fought in the, any war uh, that this c the country has fought in. And what we do with this show is um, we tape it, uh, we put one of these uh, tapes in the uh, Chelmsford Library, and we also send the tape down to the Library of Congress, and that's archived. So uh, generations are, are, are can do research in regards to uh, veterans who experience warfare um, this century. Probably uh, somebody will do uh, research 100 years from now and or 500 years from now. So uh, I behoove any veteran uh, to call Chumsford Media and um, you know let us interview you and for you to tell us your experiences. Um, I have a gentleman here uh, named Paul Krakonis. He was in the United States Marine Corps in uh, World War II and in Korea. And uh, he's going to tell us uh, his uh, story, his yarn, uh, to uh, his experiences. Um, what we usually do here is uh, we um, interview and talk about the family uh, very quickly and uh, talk about his experiences um, in the military in regards to where he took his training, etc. But um, I'm going to change the format a little bit now because uh, Paul um, was in uh, Washington, D.C. last week, was it, Paul? Yes. You, uh, for your reunion. So I want to talk about that because that's fresh in your mind in regards to uh, the experiences with the reunion and um, f uh, your fellow veterans and family members, I presume, children and grandchildren were there? Not mine, but a lot of the others. Okay. Um, Paul um, and I, um, or my family and Paul's family, have known uh, each other uh, before time. And uh, uh, Paul has known me, uh, which is unusual. How long have you known me now? Since how old? Well, you're born 46. Well, don't tell anybody. Oh, don't wow. tell anybody, but that's all right. <laughs> all right. Anyway, you were six months old when okay. we drove to New York and we saw you for the first time so, with your uncle. Wow. So we. Uh, so you didn't change any diapers on me, did you, or anything oh, no. like that? Oh, okay. In those days, men didn't do things like right. that. Is that right? So uh, we've known each other. The family has known each other. In fact, my uncle is um, a, a God, godfather. A godfather, my uncle's godfather to your son. So um, there's a, a family connection there. Um, what I'd like to do is talk about the reunion real quick. I know you were in the Marine Corps. Uh, let's talk about family real quick. Uh, you got married after the war? Uh, 1948. Oh, 1948. How many children? Three boys. Three boys. And grandchildren? Four. And you were, did you enlist or did you get drafted? When I was 17, you don't get drafted. Okay, that's I right. At 17. You enlisted at 17 uh, out of Lowell, Massachusetts. Yes. Okay. And um, from there, uh, the story goes on. But we'll, but what I want to talk about is this reunion because I think it's, it, it, it's, it's indicative of a lot of the guys. Some people who enjoy going to the reunion, some veterans do, and some veterans don't or don't even bother. Mm -hmm. So how did you get involved with your, uh, your, your unit having reunions? Can you tell me the little story uh, about it before I, we talk about Washington? They began having them in... 1983. Okay. And what it was was about five or six of the pilots from my squadron lived in Texas, Dallas, and Fort Worth and vicinity. And they started getting together periodically right. among themselves. And then they said, gee, maybe some of the other fellows from the squadron would be interested. So they started sending out whoever's address they could get a hold of. Right. They didn't, I didn't get anything from them until 1992. Wow. And when I got this letter, I called this fellow, Henry Sorry, who was a captain, one of our pilots. And I says, gee, how did you find me, Henry? He says, well, if you notice, the letter you got came from the Veterans Administration in St. Louis. And I says, yeah. He said, we couldn't find you through normal channels. channels. Yeah. So uh, some, someone told him, well, look, if he went to college under the GI Bill or if he's getting any disability from the VA, 
they would have the address. They won't give it to you, but they'll accept a letter from you with the veteran's name on it, and then they would send it to my home address. Oh, wow. At the time I was living at 12 Village Lane in Tingsboro. I've been in Tingsboro for 22, 21 years now. Right. And uh, the reunion that year was being held in, uh, no, the following year, I'm sorry, was being held in San Antonio, Texas. Okay. So my wife and I decided, well, we'll drive now <laughs> forever. Two days to get through Texas. Right. San Antonio is way state. down the Mexican border. Yeah. And, uh, but the only thing about it was, it was strange to see a fellow who, when I knew him on the island, was 19 and 20 like myself, right. and the pilots were probably a couple of years older. <laughs> we didn't recognize another by face, but we all had name tags. And right, right. The names came So in other words, us. when you were down there, you hadn't seen some of these guys for maybe 30, 40 years or something no like more that. more than that. Let's see, we got on 45, 50, oh no, let's see, 40. Yeah, about 42 years, yeah. Right, okay. So uh, did you drive down to Washington in this last reunion last no, we week? we flew down. You flew down, okay. So you stayed at a hotel? Was it at the hotel that we, you, was st you stayed at? Yes, okay. yeah, we all had. Uh, when they set it up, uh, normally in prior reunions, we'd have one of the members of the squadron would be the host because they'd have them right. in different cities. Each okay. Year. And they would set up to get the hotel uh, reservation okay. so it could be sort of all grouped okay. together. And then to set up the uh, any uh, sightseeing trips and stuff. This year, they said, well, there's an outfit in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, Armed Forces Reunions. These guys uh, do everything for everybody. Right. And what they do is they get kickbacks from the hotels and Probably. the various yeah. vendors. And they got a small amount from the squadron of what we would send in right. for registration and things. And, but it was nice. This was a nice setup. How many guys showed up this year? Thirty-five only. So that's it. Out yeah. of a squadron of and of the yeah. Of the, the, yeah the how many? How many in your, members? How many in your squadron? Uh, an original. Let's see. Total over the year, uh, six hundred. That was a bomber squadron, uh, yeah. so the the audience would know. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what what goes on in the reunion? I mean, you just talk about old times and yeah, slap each other on the back. Yeah, they have a bunch of pictures that guys took over the years and all. And right. Uh, we sit around. We have a, a ready room. In, in the hotels, one of the conditions is that they give us a room that's good size, enough to hold 50, 60 people, and uh, to have a wet bar in it. And that way they allow us to bring in our own liquor and beer and soft drinks and oh, snacks and stuff because a lot of the women people come and don't drink. You know? Right. And, uh, yeah, we sit around talking, and how's everybody doing? And well, now, did you go Did you go to the World War II monument? Or did you take a yes. tour of that? Did you, did that you take was, tours? Oh, yes. I okay. definitely was on the tour, and we, they have a computers lined up there. The monuments themselves are by state. Oh, okay. State, and not chronologically. I don't know how they have Massachusetts. It was way down on one mm -hmm. end. I don't know whether maybe... Going left to right, we were the 13th state, I think, that joined the union somewhere on that. Right. And uh, so that looked like about these huge marble columns. It's quite beautiful setup. And then they have computers, so folks like when they were, oh golly, I don't remember how many years ago that uh, I got a letter they were considering having the monument built and they wanted donations. and. Then you set your name and the information they wanted. So we're in the register. So they you're in the register? Yeah. Oh, good. That's For good. For Vietnam, they had folks that died, mm -hmm. and they have a, a big granite wall. Man, that thing must be 150, right. 200 feet long. Right. And they've got all the names. Yeah, I went to the dedication Did of you that. See yeah. Okay. yeah, so, so I've, I've seen that. Yeah. What that looks like. Yeah. But of course, World War II, there was a total of, I think, 16 million guys that were in the service. So right. Yeah. So, so it was an excellent uh, time had by all. Now, was it? Did did you see any of the, the the children of of your of the veterans uh, or your grandchildren? Did they come to to with you? None of my grandchildren. No, my, I understand my, that, yeah, but, but but the others. others. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, they yeah. were all. Yeah. They, oh. Uh, let's see. On the tours, yeah, they had the older ones came. 
but there were no no one was there with any young children, right. almost teenagers. And then some of them came. We had would have a a, din, a dinner every night, and then on Saturday night we have the banquet. And a lot of the guys would come down with their kids. One fellow from Georgia, 16 family members. Wow. Last year we had at Nashville, he showed up with 12 of them. Wow. And he says, next year I'm watching them, I'm going to have them all. But he couldn't come himself, the poor guy. He wasn't well. Yeah, that, uh, that happens to World War II veterans. That's why we like to interview the World War II veterans. It's very important that we get your history. So let's, let's talk about... Uh, the beginning of, of your experiences in the Marine Corps. All right, so um, you, were young, you were a young kid, 17 years old, uh, decided to join up, right? I, I think in those days your parents had to sign for you. What did they say? Well, they kind of gave me a hard time because I was in my middle year of my senior year in high school. Oh, wow. And my dad said, well, why don't you stay and finish high school? Yeah, good. But Makes they sense. told us, look, anyone who uh, enters and listen to service after the first half we will get your diploma oh. which my father got rest his soul mm -hmm. went up when they had the graduation thing and oh that was nice so so, yeah. so you got so you got um, um, you got your diploma but by that time you were on your way to basic training oh yeah I, I was somewhere at one of the schools in Florida oh um, so you went to basic training in Paris Island. How was that? Do you remember basic training? <laughs> Do I ever. My <laughs> first time away from home, um, boy, I'll tell you something. They, in those days, they weren't like they are today, namby-pamby. You know, you, the DI, the drill instructor, right. he says, we're gonna, the first thing they told us, we're going to make Marines out of you. And he's walking up down the aisle, and there I am standing there, five, three and a half, was under the, the minimum. Oh, wow. But I, I turned 17 in 1942, and, uh, and uh, I started going down to the Fargo building in Boston to, for a physical. Right. Uh, and by November, I guess it was. And I weighed 120 pounds, and I was five, three and a half. And I go in there, and they check me out, and then they put me on the skin. And he says, no, nope, no minimum. Get out. Don't come back for another month. Grow up in the meantime. <laughs> yes, sir. So I went out, and I was working after school at the First National on Westwood Street. And one of the fellows told me, you want to gain weight, eat a lot of bananas, and drink fraps. So every day, I'd go over to the, in those days it wasn't self-service. Mm -hmm. We had yeah. clerks in the different departments. Right. I'd go across the grocery department, and I'd get a half a pint of cream. <laughs> Then I go to Webster's Drugstore where Danny Ely office of friend of this mine is, was This working. is in Lowell, right? In Lowell. Yeah, okay. And he'd make me a frap with the cream and I'd stuff myself with bananas. Like the week before I was going to go back, mm -hmm. I'd go back, oh, I gained a pound or something. It'd throw me out again. Finally, <laughs> the fourth time in February of 43, I went on the same doctor was there and he looked at me and he says, you little rascal, are you back again? <laughs> yes, sir. You're persistent. He says, you want to go fight for your country? Yes, sir. So he said, hmm. So I could tell he didn't touch the top of my head with that thing with measuring that. your height. And he must have winked at the corpsman. Oh, look at him. He grew. 5'4", 125 exactly, he says. So he says, all right, get out. And he, I'm going out and he says to me, hey, you'll be sorry. He did say that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> doctor has, yeah. Yeah. So, so when I got to Paris Island, they got us lined up when we got off the train and the drill instructor, Sergeant, who was he a sergeant? He was a PFC, Jerry Freer, he was from Connecticut. Oh, you remember his name, oh, huh? Oh, he was mean. And he walks and he comes to me and he looks at me. How old are you? 17, sir. He says, get out, what are you, 14 or something? I oh, was didn't shave yeah, or right, anything, right. you know. I said, no, sir, I'm 17. Oh, and he says, I'll make a Marine out of you, kid. Boy, did he ever pick on me. Boy. Oh, is that right? Oh. See, once they pick on you, yeah. boy, they and don't let up. of course, you know, everywhere we went, we marched. And I was always the, the littlest, littlest guy. guy. I was all in the end. And if we were marching along, all of a sudden, you know, I'm looking around at something. Wham! He gave me a boot. <laughs> a boot, yeah. <laughs> but that kept me going. Well, that's uh, good. 
So was there anything eventful other than that? I mean, in basic training, you know, they, no, they teach they you how to shoot so rifles? Oh, yeah. But, okay. Yeah, the last two weeks of uh, training, we went uh, to the rifle, rifle range. range. What was the rifle that you used in those days? What was it? What was the rifle that you used in those days? Oh, the M1. M1, okay. Yeah, and there I was. Man, that thing, the recoil would knock me back. Oh, line. no kidding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. And how'd you do? Uh, do you remember, uh, were you an expert, shop No, shooter? no, I wasn't anywhere near expert. And thank God, because not that I would have minded probably, but uh, all the experts, uh, let's see, how was it? Expert. Sharpshooter? Expert, sharpshooter. Marksman. Marksman, that a boy, thank right. you. You're welcome. And I was a low marksman. And everybody who was a, an expert and a sharpshooter, when we got through boot camp, they shipped them right to Camp Lejeune. Oh, no kidding. The line company, which was what the Marine Corps What's called. What's a line infantry. company? What's a line company? Infantry unit? Infantry, okay. right. Okay. And I want to go to aviation because my last two years, my junior, senior year in high school, we were taking Morse code and aerodynamics and all mm -hmm. courses right. related to the military, right. you know. That's why after I got out, I had to go back and take a bunch of courses in PG, mm -hmm. history and English right. and everything. But, uh, and I thank God I remember my Morse code and they gave us a test. Oh, wow. And see who had ability. the ability for Morse code and luckily I remembered a lot of it. So that's how I got to go to radio school from Cherry Point, uh, from Basin. Paris Island. They shipped us to Cherry Point, which was the Marine Corps Air Station. Right. And a couple of weeks later, they shipped us to Jacksonville, Florida. We thought we'd All right, wait, let, we, we're jumping ahead. I want to ask you something in regards to basic training. How was the food, number one? Oh, it was pretty good. It was, it was pretty was good. good, okay. Yeah. All right. I just want to tell the audience that. Um, what happens in the military if you're a, a, a was it a sharpshooter expert is the top gun so to speak sharpshooter is mid-range and the marksman is the lower range and then uh, uh, you if you nothing. don't make it nothing. it's nothing if you don't make it and they make sure that you make it right, All right. and uh, you have to be uh, at least a minimum of marksman uh, to make it and you are a low marksman All All right. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so I was a low sharpshooter, so I mean, I know. Um, but what do you expect? I mean, you're coming from uh, New England, a state that doesn't have rifles that much, or guns, or uh, right. pistols and, and rifles, so it's kind of, you're kind of behind the eight ball because what happens, a lot of these country kids from Tennessee use the weapons when they're kids. Oh, and we had a lot of them from Tennessee. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. So um, you finished basic. Do you remember, did you have a parade after basic or anything like that? No, nope. no. There was no parade. It was just that you got your, you got a, out of basic. You got your orders. You passed the the test to go to uh, radio school at Jacksonville, Florida. Oh, okay. Well, I missed uh, something. Cherry Point. What was what was that all about? That uh, was Naval, uh, that was uh, the Marine Corps Air Station on the East okay, Coast. Okay, so some people may not know it. The Marine Corps has an Air Force. Yes. Yeah, and they have in those days they had fighters and bombers. Oh yeah. Well, initially they did, they didn't s start getting bombs until November '43. Okay. Prior to that, it was all fighters. Okay. And transport. The D, uh, so. DC three. So uh, Ted Williams was in the. Uh, Ted Williams was a fighter pilot. Fighter pilot in the Marine Corps. Right. Did you ever meet him in there? In the no, I didn't meet him, but when I came back to Cherry Point after I finished radio school and gunnery school and got into a squadron there and we were on the a flight line we had a F4Us which were the the latest fighters okay there were carrier planes and right. land-based planes of the Marine Corps so let me just jump in so uh, uh, Marine pilots flew off carriers also besides Navy pilots no well, no. no no the Marine pilots well, like I said those were land-based okay all right. And we had the Marine F4U squadrons overseas at that time. They only had F4Fs. Right. They look so tiny now mm -hmm. when you look them at the, the latest wall planes. But uh, yeah, but all Marines and uh, Marine Corps didn't have any service schools. 
So consequently, we had to go. Uh, we were part of the Navy then. Right. Even though we hated Under it. their umbrella, <laughs> yeah. But uh, we had to go to serv any service school you, uh, you went to was a Navy school. Uh, same thing like for flight training. Right. In fact, one thing a lot of people don't know, uh, I had a couple of fellows that were in my uh, company at boot camp wanted to go to flight training. So they couldn't make it as cadets to accept to get that. In those days, you had to be at least some college and they mm -hmm. wanted to be real up on your math and stuff. And uh, But then after they finished boot camp, and we got processed at uh, Cherry Point, these guys says, I want to go to flight school. So they took them, gave them a couple of tests, and they says, okay. So they went to flight school as privates. They went through the 10 month course. Mm -hmm. When they graduated, they got their gold wings, which are naval air pilot, which okay. is a designation. And they got a one stripe promotion, like all Marines. Whatever school you went to, if you passed, you got a one stripe promotion. So again, when I came back to Cherry Point, I'm going to the mess hall one day, and here comes one of those fellas in. Hey, how you doing? I'm look, hey, you made it, huh? Good, correct. How come you're only a PFC? He says, hey, would you make out of radio school a PFC? That's the best we can do. Even guys who wow, want to never, give I'll tell you another story they didn't, tell, they didn't give them uh, lieutenant bars at all? No way. No so way. So you mean you had PFC flying pl uh, fighter planes? Yep. Wow, I've never In heard fact, that before. That's oh, interesting. What was that TV series, Black Sheep Squadron? Yeah, right. 90% of the pilots that were in that squadron were I guess they got up to Buck Sargent by then. Wow. Joe Foss was instrumental in getting them promoted when he had them overseas. They were what? flying F4Fs and F6Fs. Okay. Um, so we're back to Cherry Point. Let's let's go. You're back to Cherry Point. Uh, they decide, um, how long are you in Cherry Point for before you go to radio school? And uh, I was there a couple of weeks. We were pulling mess duty, so well. That's sure usual that. when when that happens. Yeah, right? and you know, and it isn't like the army. I don't know about the navy, but I know the army. The, you get KP one day or something. One day you know, a week. It all depends on the schedule. Right. Yeah. In the Marine Corps, you got thirty days. Wow. So we were there about two weeks, and uh, peeling potatoes. No, I was. You know, I'm trying to remember. I think I was working on the. Um, Cafeteria Sir, style service, dining. Yeah, service. And when we first went into the mess hall, the mess sign says, wow, how many of you guys can ride a horse? Oh, guys put up their hands, you know. Good, he says, you're going to ride the range here. Range? Well, you got cattle here? No. <laughs> See that thing over there? The black cook stoves? <laughs> clean. <laughs> you got to go and clean all <laughs> Oh, wow. And if any of you guys have a driver's license? <laughs> Again, dummies put their hands up. Okay, you guys, you go over there, you're in charge of them the swill buckets. <laughs> wow. That, the so, old adage is don't yeah, volunteer for right. anything, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so anyway, uh, we were on mess duty for two weeks and then he... Okay, yeah. so you went from Cherry Point to um, uh, Jacksonville, Florida for radio school by train? Yes. Okay. Atlanta coastline. Atlanta coastline. How long did it take you? A day? Two days? Let's, let's see. To, to Jacksonville? About a day and a half. Oh, a day and a half. You got in there. How long was radio school? That's pretty a long school in the military. Mm. That I got there in early April, and we finished in, I think, a late latter part of July. Oh, Body okay. Day. April, okay. So I, was this for ground radio, for no, line air, units, or was this for no, air squadrons? Air, airborne, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Airborne well, if, yeah. The Navy guys were there. That were there was uh, uh, would be into carriers, right? Or uh, even into destroyers, battleships, or yeah, destroyers. Right. Yeah. You know, Morse code was yeah. Morse code. Oh, uh, okay, you know, I see. Yeah, you know, you know, and they had the same radios, type radios. Yeah. So you remember what A is, right? I mean, uh, Morse code, right? You remember? Da -da. Your Morse code? Yeah. Okay. Da -da 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 -da. Good. 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 That's good. So that was how they spoke to each other. It wasn't verbal or anything like that, like a telephone or anything like that. It was all Morse code well, that you learned at, no, no. at, at radio yeah, school? Yeah, you know, that's, just, that's odd. I'm glad you mentioned that. I never used Morse code again after I got out of radio school. Oh, no kidding. Uh, we get into the airplanes and we had the radios where you spoke over the thing. Once we were overseas, we had radio silence. We never sp <laughs> spoke oh. on the radio, only on the intercoms within the... 
the plane the itself. Plane. Uh, oh. And the pilots, when they're contacting the uh, tower for landing, landing instructions. That was it, huh? Yeah. Because they can zero in on the radio and know where you are, basically. Yeah. That was that. Was that. Uh, so you, you, went to, you went to Jacksonville, and then from Jacksonville, you went to Hollywood, Florida, right? And how long were you in Hollywood, Florida? That must have been a good Not time. Not long enough. Oh, that's it. Yeah. It was, uh, well, let's see, July, roughly about eight weeks. So it was pretty hot down there. They didn't have air conditioning in those days. No, they didn't. And mm -hmm. we knew it in Jacksonville. It was very hot there, but we were right there, right through the beginning of summer. Right. And uh, lights, lights were out at 8.30, and it's still daylight. Wow. And the aircraft are flying overhead until midnight and even later. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, we're laying in there. What's P? The da da da. Oh, thanks. And the guys would be talking to themselves. Oh, uh, no kidding. <laughs> Is that right? That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. But then they, we thought we died and went to heaven when we got to Hollywood. The, um, the base there was a Navy base again, as usual. Was uh, in, a, in a hotel. Actually, a former hotel, which was had been bought out by the Riverside Military Academy for their winter headquarters. And the main school itself was like in North Carolina, but in the winter they took the poor darlings down to mm -hmm. Hollywood and had mm -hmm. a gorgeous hotel. Right in the middle of the highway they came out of the town of Hollywood. You come down and then the highway went right around and on through, you know, kind right. of going. So when we got there, we said, gee, hmm, hotel, that's going to be nice. And they said, oh, no, you Marines, you're going over there. We look over and see these little one-story buildings with formerly when it was the military school was the stable. Wow. <laughs> and they made it into little cubicles, four-man cubicles. We shared one latrine with the cubicle next to us. What's you know, a latrine? Uh, because the, the audience uh, doesn't know what the latrine is. Right? The men's room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the showers. Okay. And uh, we had no, the hotel itself, they had guards around oh, 24 wow. hours. So the, the Navy boys, we called them Swabies, uh, couldn't go anywhere. But we were out there, we had nothing. We were by ourselves. We were a couple hundred feet from the, uh, all we had was one wing was U-shaped and one, one wing was the uh, sick bay. Right. So a couple of guys said, gee, you know, we don't have any uh, bunk checks or anything. Let's walk into Hollywood and have a couple. So we used to go out. And this one night, right near the end, about a week before we finished school, I was broke. And I said, geez, I, I'm not going. So three or four of the guys said, what we used to do, just in case they ever pulled a bunk check, we used to take our sea bag <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and put, put it in a bunk and, and put the blanket over. That's funny. Yeah. And then usually, wouldn't, everybody wasn't gone. Usually it was one or two guys mm -hmm. that were there. It's, and uh, they'd put the catch on the screen door. And when the, uh, they ever came around for a bunk check anyway, they'd just flash the light and look in there. Huh? I see four fresh right. shapes. Well, there's one night. Somebody must well, have let, said something. Let, let, let's, uh, let's hold off because basically we're running out of time. Huh. We'll have you back for another show. And, um, you know, you could tell us the story about uh, how they had bunk check. So that means that people will watch the, uh, the show and, uh, next week. So, uh, you know, it's good to have you here. And, uh, you know, uh, no problem. It's just uh, one of those things that uh, we, uh, we love having you here. So 